Dr. Ted Venema Talks Audiology, the educational whiteboard series brought to you by Next Gen Hearing. Hi, I'm Ted Venema, here to talk to you this time about the acoustic reflex. What is it and how is it tested? You may recall from a previous whiteboard session on tympanometry that pediatricians often used it in order to differentially diagnose otitis media and other conductive middle ear problems. Tympanometry is a quick and fast non-behavioral method whereby to assess middle ear function. It's used by audiologists who are quite well trained in it and also by an emerging number of hearing instrument practitioners. Testing the acoustic reflex is done by way of using tympanometry. It's a sub-test of tympanometry. And let's just quickly review the assumptions of tympanometry here. The main assumption is that the middle ear functions most efficiently at passing sound through it when air pressure on both sides of the tympanic membrane is even. Then the middle ear, as a stiff system, is least stiff and it is most compliant and thus passes most sound. If, and also recall that in tympanometry, the probe inserted in the ear has three holes. One's a speaker that emits a constant low-pitched tone. One's a microphone that picks up the sound that that tone reflected back off the tympanic membrane. And the third, the third hole allows air pressure changes to occur in the sealed, closed off ear canal from positive to neutral room air pressure to negative. If the air pressure is made, if at a neutral room air pressure in the ear canal, most sound is going through the drum and least is bouncing back, we can then safely assume that the air pressure on the other side of the eardrum is also at regular room air pressure. If, however, negative air pressure is required in the closed sealed ear canal in order to render the best tympanogram, we can then assume that negative air pressure also exists on the medial side of the TM, thus indicating an early stage of otitis media. That, however, was tympanometry. This is the acoustic reflex. Let's look at it. Figure one shows that with, tymp with tympanometry, the acoustic reflex temporarily results in a reduction of the height or the static compliance of the tympanogram. The acoustic reflex, a, a set of tiny muscles contracting in the middle ear system to tighten the already stiff middle ear, thus reducing its efficiency, thus actually causing a temporary slight degree of conductive hearing loss. So whereas tympanometry uses different air pressures to alter the amount of sound bouncing off the drum, the acoustic reflex doesn't use air pressure. It holds the air pressure at regular room air pressure because only people with normal tympanograms can really be tested with acoustic reflexes. Otitis media, you'll have absent reflexes. They're not gonna get through fluid and nor through negative air pressure. So really it's people who have normal hearing and people with sensory neural hearing loss, a big population, who have normal middle ear status and therefore normal tympanograms. These are the people that can be tested with acoustic reflexes. At any rate, holding the air pressure with the probe at regular room air pressure, suddenly a loud sound is given to the ear and when that occurs an acoustic reflex occurs thus changing the height of the tympanogram. So whereas tympanometry uses air pressure to change the amount of sound bouncing off the drum, the acoustic reflex uses a loud sound to alter the amount of sound bouncing off the drum. The acoustic reflex arc, what's all involved with it? Well just about anything related with hearing. The outer ear, the middle ear, the cochlea, the eighth nerve, the low brain stem, then the fifth and seventh cranial nerves terminating on the tensor tympani muscle and the stapedius muscle of the middle ear system. So if we look at that acoustic reflex arc, it has an afferent brain going direction as well as an efferent brain back to ear going direction. It's an arc and the afferent and efferent portions of that arc meet at the low brain stem, the superior olivary complex. So the acoustic reflex 
when you give a loud sound in one ear, it's going to cause an acoustic reflex in both ears. How come? Because of neural decussation occurring at the low brainstem. This is one of the more interesting facets of the acoustic reflex. Why do we have an acoustic reflex in the first place? It used to be thought that the acoustic reflex was nature's own protection against noise-induced hearing loss. It was nature's way of stopping hair cell damage due to loud sound stimulation. We don't really think that anymore. Really, the acoustic reflex is, occurs in order to reduce the loudness of one's own voice while one is speaking. Interesting. Let's, let, when you, what's, the, what's the average intensity of average conversational speech? Well, we hear other people through air conduction, through sound waves going through the air. And average conversational speech, well, that's about 65 decibels sound pressure level by air conduction. We hear ourselves, however, by a combination of air conduction, sound waves, and bone conduction through the vibration of our own skulls. That is why we hear ourselves so differently than other people hear us. You ever listen to your own voice on a recording? Whenever you hear it yourself, you're going, oh, is that me? Boy, I sound awful. Some would say I sound like geese farts on a muggy day. Well, poor you. I sound much richer and better to myself because I'm hearing myself through air and bone. And my own voice, the loudness of my own voice to me is not 65, it's around 85. And vowels of speech, A, E, I, O, U, and sometimes Y, those are the loudest and the lowest portions of the speech acoustic sound waves. And it's loud, low sounds that precisely are used as a stimulus to cause the acoustic reflex. So in short, really, we have acoustic reflexes to dull the loudness of our own voice while we ourselves are speaking. So, figure two, let's look at two different ways that the acoustic reflex is measured. Figure two shows the contralateral method of measuring the acoustic reflex. Figure three shows the ipsilateral method of testing the acoustic reflex. First, figure two, contralateral. This involves the tympanometer probe stuck in one ear, sealed with its three holes, the, the speaker emitting the constant low pitch tone at 70 dB SPL. It's microphone picking up the reflected sound off the eardrum. Meanwhile, a headphone is put on the opposite ear. Suddenly, out of that headphone is emitted a loud, low-pitched tone for a few seconds. Beep! And what does that do? Causes an acoustic reflex, which tightens the tensor tympani muscle and the stapedius, by the way, the stapedius muscle is much stronger of a pole than the tensor tympani. But anyway, the acoustic reflex occurs in the middle ear system, therefore reducing the efficiency temporarily of the sound transmission through that conductive middle ear system. When that happens, there's a change in the amount of sound bouncing back off of the probe tone. So a loud sound here, alters the amount of sound bouncing off the eardrum. Actually, it increases the amount of sound bouncing off the, ear, off the eardrum, therefore reducing the efficiency of this middle ear for a split second. And that reduction in tympanogram size, that reduction in static compliance in the height of the tympanogram, that is what is measured as the acoustic reflex. Figure three shows the ipsilateral method. Here, the probe is put in one ear, and that's emitting the low pitch tone that's reflected off the drum, and at the same time then, the loud, sudden, low pitch acoustic reflex stimulus also is emitted out of that same probe. And so you can think of the complexity, think of the possible or potential interactions between that loud stimulus used to elicit the acoustic reflex and the ongoing low frequency tone that's constantly emitted and bouncing off the drum. There's high potential of interaction between those two tones and that goes a long way to explaining why ipsilateral acoustic reflex measurements came later than contralateral acoustic reflex measurements. At any rate, we'll return to that in just a bit. Why do we test the acoustic reflex? The acoustic reflex arc, as we said, covers a lot of hearing areas. And 
First of all, we can say the conductive hearing loss, it obliterates the acoustic reflex. If the acoustic reflex is a tightening of two little muscles, that really isn't going to be measured with, a tympan with tympanometric, tympanometric methods when there's a negative air pressure behind the drum or when there's otitis media fluid behind the drum. So conductive hearing loss essentially obliterates the acoustic reflex. Acoustic reflexes are re really done with people who have normal tympanograms, as we said earlier, and this involves normal hearing and people with sensory neural loss, up to a moderate severe level. Past a severe sensory neural loss, you're not gonna get acoustic reflexes at all. At any rate, Think of the uses. It's non-behavioral. What would you do if you thought someone was malingering or lying in a hearing test? If he or she has present acoustic reflexes, eh, gotcha. That's one sinister or forensic reason. Another more loving reason, it was used in order to differentially diagnose cochlear from retrochochlear lesions. And in those days, now think of the 1970s when all of this came out. CT scans didn't exist very much. They only came out in the 71, I think, CT scans. MRIs barely existed at all. So differential diagnosis of eighth nerve, neuromas, brainstem lesions, cochlear loss. If someone has a hearing loss in one ear, hmm, that's a positive sign of, could be an eighth nerve tumor. Well, you'd use acoustic reflexes to help differentially diagnose. Was that just a unilateral hair cell cochlear damage or was that unilateral hearing loss due to an eighth nerve tumor? So we used to use ipsilateral and contralateral reflexes. We would compare the results between those sets, those measurements. Because remember, contralateral, loud sound is put here and the measurements made in the opposite ear. If you had a different pattern of reflexes for here than for ipsilateral, you might help to, you might, it might help to differentially diagnose between deep intraaxial brainstem lesions as opposed to eighth nerve schwannoma or a neuroma, so an eighth nerve tumor. So the comparison of the two used to be used in order to help differentiate between low brain stem and eighth nerve tumors. Today we've got CT scans and MRIs and so the use of both of these has tended to recede. Now today clinicians seem to pick a, pick a coin, any coin. Pick ipsilateral, use it, or pick contralateral, use that. It doesn't matter. It's not like one is better than the other, okay? So we tend to just focus on the use of one, e either of these two measures. So to, but to, here's, let's look at a more interesting reason to return to the use of a, acoustic reflex testing. We mentioned the acoustic reflex arc, outer ear sound, uh, outer ear, middle ear, cochlea, what part? inner hair cells. The inner hair cells are afferent. The eighth nerve connects with the inner hair cells, not so much the outers. So outer ear, middle ear, inner hair cells, eighth nerve, low brain stem, and then back out the fifth cranial nerve to the tensor tympani muscle, back out the seventh cranial nerve to the stapedius muscle, thus is the acoustic reflex arc. Well, Let's look at two people with sensory